My friend, we've done a lot of episodes of TFL Talking Trucks, but this may be the largest. This is the big kahuna, the giant enchilada, the guapo of El Guapos. Supreme? This is the supreme. Guys, you have no idea how much work Andre has put into this. This is over a month's worth of solid research in between everything else he's done. He hasn't even shaved or changed his underwear while he's been researching this stuff. Wow. And we're talking about three, not one, not two, but three different engineers that he has talked to directly about this upcoming topic. Yes. So this is the topic that comes from you guys, the listeners and viewers of mm -hmm. TFL Truck. Uh, all of the mid-sized truck, not all of them, but all the new ones that are coming this mm -hmm. year over the next few months have either completely moved away from V6s uh, or even, you know, they introduced turbocharged engines, mm. even hybrids with right. turbocharged engines. Right. Uh, and they really stepped away from diesel technologies mm -hmm. and V6 engines. And you said, no, give me back my V6 Tacoma. Give me back all this stuff. Give me back the diesel Colorado. But why did they say that? They are worried. You guys are worried about reliability, yes. maintainability. How do I work on my own truck? Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to be reliable? Is there going to be suit built up <laughs> on my valves? Yeah, yeah. Will, will, will injectors have issues? All these other things. So taking this into account and the fact that you guys have been yelling about this for, for months, really, in many ways, ever since Ford started this whole thing with EcoBoost, which we'll go into in a little bit. Yeah. Andre has been taking notes, and now we have a video that you, and also a podcast, that you guys are going to be able to watch and listen to, where Andre actually answers your questions. And real quickly, why don't we mention Honda or Nissan? Well, that's because they don't have turbocharged four-cylinder engines. In their mid-sized trucks. Correct, yes. Mondo. Yes. So, uh, three things, like you said. Uh, I've talked to uh, Kevin Luchansky from General Motors uh -huh. about the Chevy Colorado and GMC Canyon. Right. I've talked to Mike Manjack from Ford about the Ford Ranger upcoming EcoBoost engines. Right. And Brian Schneiderwind at Tacoma, uh, at Toyota. Um, he's actually VP for all powertrains. <laughs> so he's not messing around. No. No. Uh, so we'll go one by one. Uh -huh. uh, but before, we have to thank our Patreon supporters. That's right. And we even have a little question. Yes. So, as always, you can support us using patreon.com slash TFLcar. It's the only page for TFL Studios. Mm -hmm. You can support all of our podcasts. We have a car and a truck podcast. We have eight channels on YouTube that mm -hmm. you can support. <laughs> and recently, Brandon Zyder uh, uh, had a question for okay. me. Um, directed at me at patreon.com. He says, my pleasure, Andre, for supporting. Thinking about getting a 2023 Colorado Trail Bus, are you still liking yours? So I purchased my Chevy Colorado Trail Bus about two months ago, mm -hmm. and I've had some uh, usage out of it already. I've taken it to the lake yes, you with have. a boat. I towed a camper with it, also to a campground. Um, I've done a couple of trips, and I love the way this little truck works. Mm -hmm. So towing boats, towing trailers, actually bringing my family to places, uh, I think it's quite capable. But, but. I, I've had a little bit, a couple tech glitches. And you know what my latest tech glitch is? I'm not going to say anything about cruise control, by the way. No, 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 never. Uh, my reverse camera just went out. <laughs> Now, some of you guys are going to say something to the effect of, well, this is the first year of the vehicle. It's brand exactly, new. And, exactly. And there's glitches to be expected. And you would be right. I agree with you. Uh, technically, I bought a second year vehicle. And, and so far, knock on wood, I've been okay. But that is part of it. However, some of this tech has been around for a little while. And so what else has gone wrong? Nothing. Screen? Well, that fixed itself. After I rebooted the truck. But that's a problem still. Even even if something fixes its stuff, it's still a problem. Yeah, you know but, but we did a whole video about that already. Yeah, we did an entire so, video. So the bottom line, I still love it. It's it's getting better efficiency than, than it did when it was well, brand, brand new. Yeah. So it's broken in. It tows really well. It's very stable. I'm super happy with it. All right, so this takes us into the first interview. That's correct. So the first interview is regarding uh, the Colorado and the Canyon, which have been all redesigned, and all of them now have 
a version of a turbocharged four-cylinder engine. Yes, the new 2.7-liter turbo, uh, the one that's in my truck as right. well. And here's one specific question that Kevin will address, as, as, as well as others, mm -hmm. is you said it's a direct injection engine, mm -hmm. and you guys are wor worried, worried about carbon buildup on valves mm -hmm. and you, the oil or the positive crankshaft valve <laughs> recirculation. There you go. Sorry. PCV. I, yeah, PCV. I'm sorry. Okay, I... No. You brain, got it. You got brain, it. It's okay. Brain fart. <laughs> no, you had it. You had it. And Kevin answered this. Let's go to Kevin now. Yeah. So I'm Kevin Luchansky, assistant chief engineer on the 2.7 liter engine, and uh, kind of almost everything 2.7 liter is uh, is I guess my overall responsibility. So um, and I help with uh, with pulling what I'm showing together here these these animations with marketing. So pretty pretty excited about this. We've been wanting to tell the story of the 2.7. Um, a lot of these words are, uh, are my own words, but um, we've had people turn the engineer speak into probably uh, something that most people understand a little bit easier. So um, these are movies, hopefully they come through fairly smooth, but anybody can go to this on Chevy.com um, and play it themselves. And if you're interested in the engine, I think you'll learn a lot by, uh, by playing these. So, I'll play them. There's stop points in here to give time to read. So this talks about the crankshaft, fully forged bottom end. We describe it here. And then, as I said, it, it sort of stops and it loads. Mm -hmm. So it gives some time to before the next thing comes up or you can just click on it. Uh, Tri-metal rod bearings, uh, diesel technology that we've put into the pistons, really highlighting that. And it just it describes everything in detail here. I gotcha. Is it coming through pretty well? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you asked about timing chain. So um, we yes, there's a, a timing chain on on the front end. There's also a timing chain on the back end that drives the balance shafts and and through gears we drive the uh, the oil pump through through that. We didn't highlight that in this particular animation. Um, we we highlighted the front. So if I go back, I like to show the, the details. So let me stop this. So here's a little detail. So I feel like with this engine, um, we really focused on, on the details. Um, I, I feel like um, in the past, some people would question, you know, General Motors in terms of paying attention to all the details. And I feel like this, this engine is, is an example of us really paying attention to the details. This is a pressure relief valve that we added into the hydraulic tensioner. And all it is doing is dropping the load in, in the chain tension under certain certain conditions. And it really drives, it, it's, it's just a little detail, costs a little bit of extra money to do this, um, but it really provides a lot of benefit to the chain drive. It lowers the, the maximum chain load in, in the engine. So um, tried to highlight these little things. There's so many things like this and marketing had to had to stop me because I probably had a uh, <laughs> hundred more things that I wanted to share and mm -hmm. just couldn't share them all. But um, as you can tell, you know, this is this takes a couple minutes to walk through. Really tried to show some of the ones that I think are unique to the engine, um, a little bit unique to the industry, um, and and make the engine what it is. So. So yeah. So there's a big question from some of our viewers, Kevin, that say that are concerned between like timing belt and timing chain. Um, what would you say? Obviously the chain is a more durable solution. It, it really depends on the application. For our application, uh, 2.7 truck engine, we liked the chain. Um, chain drive in the front and in the back for us. Um, but there's, and it's because of the architecture, right? It really comes down to how the layouts work. Uh, the diesel, for instance, the three liter diesel, I think that question probably comes from the three liter diesel. Um, it has a belt drive in the back, but the architecture of that is it, it yields itself um, to to a belt drive. It's it's a very simple, big, um, it has big sprockets on both the oil pump. It's only driving the oil pump. So it's a big sprocket on the crank, a big sprocket on the oil pump. There's no tensioner. It's it's just a just a single loop. It's it's as simple as a belt drive can get. Mm -hmm. um, and what belt drives have come so far, the industry uses, um, especially especially in Europe, I would say 50% of the engines use a, a wet belt. 
Um, so we've got experience with them on some of our smaller engines. Um, for the chain drive, I, most of our engines, um, especially in, in trucks, we use we use chain drives. Okay, so good. Gotcha. In, in this application, the train drive was was the right solution. So does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep playing this, and then we'll get into the PCB system. So this shows on the cutaway that when we were there in San Diego, I was trying to show you uh, the liner and how the liner is cast in in place, and um, that it's a spiny lock. So we really showed that in the animation talks about heat and, and how turbo engines have more heat. Talk about the first first off the oil uh, filter. So at, in San Diego, um, at that time, I was thinking about how these videos were gonna come out or how these animations were gonna come out. So a lot of the things that we discussed in San Diego made it into this animation. So we, we had just started working on these animations at that time and we, we just released them this week. It took us a while to get Get them released into the Colorado, but um, as you can see, they're very beautiful. Um, really proud of what we've done here, and I th think it, it it highlights and showcases uh, why the engine is durable. So there's one here for performance. You didn't ask about performance. Um, this one's really neat. It shows it shows the combustion. It shows the fuel entering the cylinder. Um, it shows the turbocharger. We'll kind of walk walk through this. So combustion through the exhaust into the turbocharger. You can see the dual loop design of the turbocharger here that is unique to, to this engine. Yeah, that's really cool because when I say dual volute, everybody looks at me like like you know, like a deer in the headlights, right? What uh, is that? <laughs> yeah. So, so to actually I'm not gonna read all this. Um I've, I've talked to you in the past and said many of these similar words, but they're, they're here and folks can click on this and, and uh, spend as much or as little time as they want trying to understand this. Charger cooler, air going through the charger cooler, um, and then back up to the intake. So um, obviously one complete circuit um, running through the engine and you know why does this engine perform as it does? Um, how does it make the great low end torque that it does? Um, we talk about that in here, so and and how that works in, in practicality. So, I think it's awesome that you have one of these. You own, you own a truck, yeah, um, and and you you have one of these, so you're experiencing it um, day to day. And um, yeah, who, who better now to talk talk about it than you? So. So, yeah, and I had a couple of questions related to that as well. And we can talk about the oil system because you showed the direct injection, uh, yep. basically. Uh, but in my experience, I have about 2,000 miles on my truck now. Yep. So I've had it for about five weeks. And I have a Colorado Trail Boss. And obviously with this engine, um, with the midi, mi, middle power uh, output, 310 horse <laughs> and 390 torque. Uh, and... Couple things. So I, I've noticed. Well, first of all, it seems like it's getting more efficient as it's breaking in. So I, I just recently did a, a test, uh, a highway loop that we haven't published yet, but it will be coming soon. Um, and I was able. I was very happy because I was able to really beat the EPA rating by a big margin. So um, that video is a separate video that we can show as well. Um, I was quite happy. And then it seems like. It's getting a little bit more sprightly, you know, like after about 500 miles. Does that make any sense um, as it's kind of wearing in? Um, I mean, friction's a real thing, right? Um, all the bearings in the entire vehicle need to wear in. Um, the, the brakes, you know, the, the, the friction does get better. I would say 500 to 1,000 miles, depending on how you drive, right? Uh, the friction is going to come down. It could take, could take a little bit longer, but um, yeah, that's, that's a real thing. I'm surprised you you notice it. We're not doing anything from an engine control perspective that limits torque or, or power. Um, right off the bat, it'll it'll make uh, rated rated power and torque. Obviously, there's some stabilization that's required due to due to the friction, um, but it, we're talking you know sm small amount of power and torque loss. But I, I from you. a fuel economy perspective, you'll you'll notice a break a break in in the trucks for sure. I got gotcha. you. All right, so, so there was this question from several viewers about direct injection 
and potential kind of buildup um, and longevity um, issues. Um, so can you kind of talk about this um, PCV system? Yep. Yeah. So I've never actually been able to talk to this. We just haven't had an opportunity to, to talk through it. So I think it's a, a great question. Um, I do see the same thing in the forums. Um, so, you know, here, here's one as an example, you know, should I put a catch can on my, on my engine? And, and, and it gets down to um, carbon deposits on the intake man, or on the intake valves. So um, when we design the engine, and I, I try to really drive this home, this engine was specifically designed for pickup truck use, uh, mid-size truck and full-size truck. So everything about it, and and it being a turbo, right? There, this was not an engine that, that we just strapped a turbo onto it, a naturally aspirated engine that we strapped a turbo onto. The entire engine was a clean sheet engine um, with turbocharged truck engine in mind. So with that being said, um, we one of the really important things is the is the PCV system. So we spent a lot of time on the PCV system, making sure the volumes of it and size sizing all the passages in it um, correctly for the the amount of flow that the system is going to see um, and that we got the separation right. So uh, it's a dual stage PCV system. What so if it's a a what little is, bit unique. There is some some patents out there that GM has with respect to a, a dual stage. So there's a, a core separator on the side of the block. It's integrated into the side of the into the side of the block, and then we come up. Uh, the the flow works its way up. I've got some pictures of it. As as much as we want to go into detail, I'm willing to do. Um, it it flows up into the fine separator, and then the fine separator decides uh, based on if it's boosted or not boosted. Uh, goes into the intake manifold. There's a worm track in the intake manifold, and we actually flow the PCV, system, PCV gases into each one of the runners, so all four runners here. Uh, in boost, there's check valves. I've got some pictures of that. Um, that then direct the PCV into the uh, induction of the of the compressor, so it goes right into the front side of the of the turbocharger. Can you define so, what, is, what is PCV? Can you please define it um, a little bit? Yeah. So positive crankcase ventilation is what it stands for. So um, every engine, when it runs, uh, there's blow by through through the piston rings. Um, it's just it's just inherent. The the rings don't seal everything. So there's gas that that goes by, and then that gas ends up mixing up with with oil. Um, and the key is to separate that oil back out of the gas. We then reintroduce that gas um, into the intake stream. So it gets it gets reburned. It just continuously cycles. Mm -hmm. um, every engine past I think 1968 was <laughs> when when PCV systems were implemented. Every engine, every you know, every gas engine has a PCV system on it. So um, ours is specifically designed again for truck use for towing. Um, there's a lot of questions. Do we do we need or does GM recommend um, a, a catch can? No, no. We designed the system so you don't need it. So I would okay. say don't don't invest, don't cut this line and put put a PCV system or a PCV catch can in here. It's not it's not needed. Okay. And uh, how does it separate it? I mean, uh, um, can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so here's a section through the engine. Um, crankshaft rotates in this direction. There is force. Spots where the gas. So if you if you can imagine the pistons are in here, I didn't I didn't have them on, but the gas is coming down through the bores into each one of these bays. There's four bays, right? It's cylinder one, cylinder two, cylinder three, cylinder four. Um, so the the gas goes from that bay directly up in in a quiescent area, which means you can see we strategically put counterweights um, where these feeds are. There's four feeds, and then those feeds go up into this coarse separator. So it just all this thing is doing. There's there's a number of baffles in here. Um, all this is doing is trying to slow the air down and, and give time for that oil to drop back out. And then as the air is going through channels, it's starting to hit in pingers. And I've, I've got a picture of that here. So um, the core separator is out of the picture in this case. It's down below. We then work our way up through the block and the cylinder head and then into the fine separator. So here's another one of those impingers here. So as you can imagine, the air is coming and there's still a little bit of oil. 
as that oil hits the wall, it gets stuck on the wall, it drips down, um, and it, it ends up dripping back down. This is the fine separator. So it's an active turbulator. Uh, you can see a little spring in here. It's basically like a, uh, a spring you'd find in a, ball, a ballpoint pen. Um, as the airflow is low, so um, you know low engine load, uh, blow by is literally a function of cylinder pressure and, and effectively torque. Um, so as the cylinder pressures go up, you leak more. So you have, you know, by the ring, so the, the airflow is higher. So as the airflow is low, uh, these this is this is shown in this case fully closed, um, but this starts to move as the airflow goes up, and all it's doing is forcing the air around all these impingers and separating the oil. The oil drains out. This is a little, little drain right here. It drains out and it goes back into a dedicated oil drain back. So you can see that in this picture here. So here's another picture of the core separator. This is actually a, a, a document that we share with the EPA on, on how the system works. So you can see the core separator works its way up through very big channels. Again, uh, gets to the engine architecture. We knew what the airflow was going to be, the blow-by flow was going to be, so everything's designed for that. You never want to speed that air back up because it'll re-entrain oil. So it's all about keeping it slow all the way through, uh, having the impingers, um, and then and then runs through the fine separator up to the turbo. We didn't show the, the intake side in this case, but you can, you can see that here. So it runs through the intake manifold. Here's gotcha. a better picture. Gotcha. Well, that's um, yeah. We didn't touch on this in our previous discussion, so so I really uh, really appreciate that that you actually um, with diagrams because that helps a lot to see it visually. Yep. And then I think you you wanted to ask the question on well, what about the intake valves? So um, on our engine, there's these are the three key points. Uh, I would say for for really any GM engine, these are the points, right? So keep the oil off the valves. We just spent a lot of time talking about the PCB system. Um, we think we're doing that. Uh, we've got data that, sh that shows that we're doing that. Um, so we're pretty proud of our PCB system. Um, there's also tighter uh, intake seals. So, so you can see a cross section through the cylinder head in this case. So intake seal, exhaust seal. These have different leak rates. The exhaust needs more oil going down it, the intake less. So um, two different part numbers on the seals. Um, and the key is, again, keep the oil off the back side of the intake valve so it doesn't doesn't coke. The other thing is um, GM's got Dexos oil. The Dexos oil was specifically designed for turbo engines um, and to reduce coking. So, um, you know, it, it's obviously very much recommended to use Dexos oil. It's, it's uh, there's a lot of things I read online, you know, should we or shouldn't we use uh, synthetic oil? Dexos oil is a synthetic-based oil. Um, highly recommend uh, Dexos-approved oil. And most oils these days, synthetic oils are. Uh, um, but, but look for that Dexos, uh, that logo on, on any oil that you're using. Gotcha. And then um, a really simple picture. Uh, so the intake port on a turbo engine is designed very line of sight. It's, it's basically, think of a of a leaf blower. I think this is a, diff a, a thing that's different for turbo engines. Um, think of a, a leaf blower basically blowing at the back side of the valve. So anytime there is a little bit of oil on there, the, the flow, especially when you're into the turbo, the flow going through these ports is very high. Um, there's not much that can hang on, if, if you will, um, because it's it's always getting blown on hard and cleaning that the back side of the valve off. So. Sweet. That's all I got. Awesome. Well, um, I learned a lot. Uh, final question. I know we are running a little short on time, but my final question is, um, is the, um, the two cylinder mode? Uh, because oh, yeah. whenever, whenever, uh, we talk about engines in general, um, people usually question, uh, those systems where kind of, uh, some cylinders shut down or are not actually used. Um, mm -hmm. so how's that system? Can you address that a little bit? Yeah, so the system is a, a bit unique on this application. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of experience with our V8s uh, that, that use active fuel management. That's what GM calls when we when we turn off cylinders. Um, it's a very different system than, than the system that we've employed here. Um, you can see, 
I wasn't prepared to, to show pictures of it, but you can see it a little bit here. Uh, there's a cross section through the camshaft. There's there's an animation when we launch the engine that shows how it works on YouTube. You, you can find it, um, but it's an electromechanical system. So you can see that here. These are the actuators on top. Um, you drop a pin into a groove, and as the camshaft rotates, it's quite simple technology. It's basically technology that's been used in printing presses since the turn of the century. It's a it's a uh, um, an axial camshaft. It then shoves the cam over to a different position. And on the intake, we've got three positions on the exhaust um, two, and the center two cylinders go to, from high lift. In this case, you can see the full the full high lift to a zero lift, and that's how we shut those center cylinders off. Um, and, the system works very well. And, uh, and is and, there, because there's always the question comes back to durability, right? Um, yeah. So, but how, does that affect long-term durability? I mean, what, what is kind of your, your view on this? The system works really well. Okay. Um, I, it has no impact on long-term durability. Okay. Yeah. We run our system. So, you know, from a durability perspective, I think I've talked about this before. Um, we run over the road testing. Um, we actually con contract Roush to do that. And if you lived in the Metro Detroit area, you would, you would see Roush driving our trucks around. Um, we run very high mileage on, on our vehicles and the system's always running. Um, you know, it, it only goes in at pretty light loads. So, um, I would say, you know, in a truck like yours around 40 miles an hour, as you're starting to tip out of the gas, you'll, you'll get it. And, um, if, in the mid-sized truck uh, in the Colorados and Canyons, if you look at the instantaneous fuel economy, you can put it on your dash or on the center screen. It it says eco, so when it's got the green eco, it's in AFM. It's got the two center cylinders shut down. And so I've, I've otherwise, seen, it's pretty imperceivable. Yeah, I, I've noticed that label, uh, that little yep. eco um, uh, indicator on my screen, yep. but it doesn't stay on very long. Does, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, so you have a trail boss. It's got big tires. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it is truly running in two-cylinder mode and, and uh, not boosted. So uh, we don't make a lot of torque. But when it's active, if, if, you, watch your, uh, if you watch your fuel economy, it, it really works. It's, uh, it, there's nothing that competes with active fuel management in terms of saving fuel when it's, when it's active. So, you know, if you wanted to hypermill, you could, you could try to drive around and, and try to keep it in, in uh, AF. Um, but the the lighter trucks, we, we actually get a fair amount of, of usage out of it. So like a, like an LT, for instance, um, on the all all terrain tires, you'll you'll see a fair amount of it. So, all right, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, really love this um, detail, and yep. I'm sure the audience loves it as well. So really appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. And we're back. Actually, after listening to Kevin mm -hmm. and that he also showed a, a couple of uh, visual aids yeah. you know little uh, animation which really and, helps and graphs yeah uh, I'm surprised by how much technology they were able to stuff into this one engine well considering how many vehicles this engine's eventually going to go into leading up to eventual electrification and everything else that they're doing it makes sense I mean this is a big investment for them yeah it's already in the Sierra and the Silverado trucks right. as a base engine now it's in also in the mid-sized trucks and you know they have this clever system that doesn't allow too much oil back into the top of the engine and prevents the, some of those issues you guys were worried about now look I know you guys will have other questions and this is the great part about what we're doing is that you can all write to us you can send uh, information in you know of course to patreon through patreon or you can also leave some uh, statements and questions below in the comments if you're watching this on video. Yes. But now I think what we need to do is, I earlier I mentioned uh, EcoBoost. And yes. EcoBoost really was, and essentially EcoBoost is turbocharging, right? Um, and I remember when Ford came out and straight out said, we are moving almost our entire fleet over to turbocharged four and six cylinder engines. And in some Brains cases, exploded. Yeah, and, yeah. and I'm just like, what? What? Because, I mean, you know, those four was, you know, V8s and, and chunky V6s and whatnot that were not turbocharged. So early EcoBoost engines did have some issues, didn't they? Yes, but they started with their F-150, actually, mm -hmm. when they introduced the EcoBoost engine into truck space. Into trucks, yes. Yeah, um, and actually Mike Manjak, who I'm speaking with mm -hmm. uh, in the upcoming interview that we're going to play right now, 
he was involved in those early developments of the uh, twin turbo V6 EcoBoost engine. So he was able to sort of boil down what had gone right, what had gone wrong, and was able to make modern upgrades to what's you know, the upcoming Ford Ranger. Yeah, the 2024 Ford Ranger. By the way, the Colorado and Canyon are already on sale, right? Yes. The 2024 Ranger comes on sale later this year mm -hmm. uh, with actually... Well, three turbocharged engines. That's correct, if you're counting the Ranger Raptor. Yeah. yeah. They have the Ranger Raptor 3-liter V6 turbo, twin turbo. They have the 2.7 twin turbo in the regular Ranger, mm -hmm. and also the 4-cylinder, the 2.3-liter turbo. And they actually made a few tweaks um, to the latest engines, and so I, was, I wanted to get all the information from Mike. Well, let's go to that right now. Well, Mike, welcome, welcome to the podcast, and um, please introduce yourself for the audience. Sure, thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. I'm Mike Manjack and I work at Ford Motor Company. I am the department manager for engine performance development. And uh, you know, our jobs and responsibilities are to run engine only dynamometer tests to validate engine attributes. Well, good, well, uh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, you're the expert in the field. And uh, we're talking about, I wanna focus this conversation a little bit more on the upcoming 2024 Ford Ranger, mm -hmm. uh, because that's coming. And it's really kind of, you know, the year of the midsize pickup truck uh, this year. Uh, there's a lot of competition, and a lot of things happening, uh, but Ford, uh, well, in the Ranger, especially, there's gonna be three power plant options. They're all EcoBoost, they're all turbocharged, uh, can you please list them pretty quickly uh, here for us? Yeah, we're excited to offer those three different variants. It's 2.3 liter, which is an I-4. And we're also going to have a 2.7 liter V6. And then a 3 liter V6 that are all turbocharged. Uh, the 2.7 liter and the 3 liter are both V6s uh, with a astonishing three liter that's going to be pushing out 405 horsepower. Yeah, this uh, this in the midsize truck. Right. Nonetheless, I, know, so. I was looking I was looking back uh, in the past, you know, back to to, you know, the early 2000s and how much uh, an engine put out back then. And, you know, you're lucky to get a uh, 200 horsepower uh, V8 at the time. So big, big uplift here coming. Uh, in these new products. So there are a lot of benefits of turbocharging, right? Like you're saying, there is also low end torque, right? right. Uh, there is high horsepower and just drivability, right? Especially because um, you're also using a 10 speed automatic mm -hmm. uh, with, with these engines. So there are a lot of uh, gear options uh, for these engines to use. Uh, but um, we, have, we have some comments from our viewers and listeners who, who are saying, uh, because uh, they're concerned about direct injection, they're concerned about lo longevity and kind of durability uh, because these are truck engines, right? Uh, so for pickup trucks and they're often uh, towing trailers uh, or off-roading or going slowly in high environment, you know, hot, hot environments, climbing hills, etc. cetera. Um, so can you give me a, a well, so that, that's why we're doing this uh, series on, on engines. And can you give me some perspective on this? Because Ford's been doing this for a long time, uh, even with the F-150. Right. Yeah, looking back in the past, uh, I was part of the team that worked on putting the, uh, the first EcoBoost engine into an F-150. And at that point, you know, it was a big, big task for us to, to make that leap from turbocharged engines and cars to going to trucks, making sure that our products are durable for our customers. Um, you know, back in the past, we did a, uh, series there that I was part of called torture testing. And, uh, I actually got to run quite a bit of the testing on that initial EcoBoost engine going into the F-150, uh, making sure that it's durable and it meets all of our customers' expectations for longevity. And, uh, that is a mindset that we have carried forward here at Ford for, uh, all of our additional upgrades for EcoBoost engines going into cars and trucks, we're always customer focused. And we realize that truck customers do work that, um, that maybe 
uh, cars may not be customers that are driving cars are not exposed to. And that goes into our testing. You know, when we're testing a, a truck. We need to make sure that a truck engine, we need to make sure that it's durable and meets all those expectations to cover all of the different customers that are going to use it. So, you know, working in, in the durability field, uh, a lot of our tests are designed to encompass those truck customers. Yeah. Well, that, let's, um, um, well, and then in the F-150, I think it was a 2011 model year, maybe of the F-150 where the EcoBoost engine was introduced. So this is already, you know, what, 12 plus years of right. turbocharging technology. So let's focus on the 2.3. Right, so um, the 2.3 uh, engine, 2.3 liter, um, has been in the Ranger since 2019 model year. And uh, it's been carrying forward, right, into this new one. Yep. Yeah, so we've, we've got some history on that, that engine. This is the uh, third upgrade for the 2.3 liter uh, that we're working on right now. Uh, the carryover one for, for 2024 is, uh, is the uh, second upgrade and uh, lots of lots of great capability in that engine, uh, being able to generate the 270 horsepower that that product puts out. Um, you know, focusing on that engine when we did our durability testing on that one, it was customer focused to make sure that that we are studying the the way that the customer uses the vehicle and testing at those specific points, making sure that we go out to the highest percentile customer and, and making sure that we are not missing any of those uh, test points, whether it be speed and load or the number of cycles that the, the customer will need to endure, that the engine will need to endure while it's on in the vehicle. Um, but that's that's how we go about it. It's always customer mindset first, and and making sure that we're meeting all of their needs. So you know, a test for a car customer maybe will be different when we go to the truck. I gotcha. Because yeah, that engine was also. I mean, it also existed in other vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. Mustang, I believe, has has a version of it, um, version, and also yes. previously the Focus as mm -hmm. well. Right. Um, so can you tell me about some of these upgrades or some, or at least one or two like recent changes, because when people look at engines or, or at least me from, from the side, right. Uh, I see the same displacement, same engine, uh, mm -hmm. or I think, oh, it's, it's the same one. Right. Right. But, but you're making certain changes or updates to them. Right. Yeah. If you compare a naturally aspirated engine, for example, to a turbocharged engine, we know that to get the most out of the turbocharged engine and be able to uh, get that higher level of, of performance out of it, we're gonna have to push that engine a little bit harder. Um, one, one item we do to try to improve the durability of the engine and increase its longevity is uh, in the piston, we add steel ring carriers where a lot of our naturally aspirated engines run at a lower cylinder pressure level and don't need that level of technology. But when we're going to those higher levels of, of, uh, of output, we, we add items like steel ring carriers, for example, to try to uh, add capability to the piston design. We're also looking at uh, specific oil squirters for the piston cooling, where we are gonna squirt oil into the piston to help cool them down. A lot of our engines nowadays are moving over to um, oil gallery pistons where we target a jet of, of oil that goes up into the piston and cools the piston down circumferentially uh, to try to uh, give a cooler piston operation and uh, keep everything under control when we're putting more demand on the engine. So how does that work? I mean, usually, so some of the oil comes from the bottom, right? Uh, mm -hmm. the squirters. So can yep. you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we'll actually have a, a finger that, uh, is a, a fine tube that will spray oil into a hole in the bottom of the piston. And then it goes around the piston and, uh, cools it down. So you have a jet 
of oil that's directed right at this entrance to the piston and allows that additional cooling to, to go to the piston. I gotcha. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I mean, uh, it's pretty high tech. Uh, what about uh, people, are these, these are direct injected engines, correct? Right. So uh, I, I hear a lot of, you know, people's concern about, you know, carbon buildup on the valves. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, that's that is a, uh, a concern. We uh, we do see when you don't have any port fuel injection, you will have buildup on the backside of the of the uh, valves. We go through a rigorous test that we are looking to make those types of evaluations to make sure that we don't have that that buildup to a point where we have a concern. Okay. A lot of our engines now are even going to PFDI, where you'll have both a DI system and a PFI system, uh, like we've done in the 3.5 liter F-150, and uh, that concern goes away. I gotcha. So tell me a little bit more about the 2.7 and 3.0. They're kind of the same family of uh, V6 engines, correct? Right. So it, its code name is Nano. And it's a, they're a series of V6 engines that uh, uh, we've had in production now for, for quite a while. And this is a recent upgrade that we're extending to the Ranger, um, both real similar engines in general. So um, they're related because are there dimensionally they're about the same or how, how do they compare, I guess, physically? Yeah, the uh, the engines themselves are uh, um, have different compression ratios and um, are come, come with distant, different displacements as well. So I can follow up and send some specific, specifics over on exactly the differences between the two. And then but yeah, the they're first, essentially the same family. Yeah, but uh, then we we also mentioned the three liter. This is for the Ranger Raptor. Uh, 405 horsepower, like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, and uh, I was talking to uh, Carl from Ford Performance as well. And, um, you know, he was saying that, you know, that engine needs to be kind of ready to go always and kind of pre-spooled up. Um, how, how you, um, how's it uh, tuned? Can you tell me a little bit more about the 3 three O? Yeah, when we're when we're setting up an engine, you know, we do a lot of work to make sure that we're matching the right turbocharger to that engine to make sure that it has the right performance at the peak power point, but is also responsive at the low end as well. You know, we don't want to have excessive turbo lag. So a lot of upfront design work and validation goes into making sure that that turbocharger is sized appropriately um and designed appropriately to deliver those performance attributes i gotcha um then um also there's a question about uh, timing chain versus timing belt mm -hmm. um you know people have this perception that the timing belt uh to you know to drive the valves um is you know is not as durable uh can you talk to me a little bit about that you know timing chain versus timing belt um, so the, all three of these engines run with a timing chain uh, to drive the camshafts. Uh, the the 2.7 liter and the 3 liter both do have a belt that drives the oil pump um, that's uh, also crank driven. Um, durability wise, you know, they go through the same level of rigor and in, in testing that we put all of our components through. So they're they're getting subjected to all the harsh uh, duty cycles that we are putting every other component through and making sure that they're, they meet all their design requirements. So really, I mean, um, is it true? Would you agree that the chain timing chain is just more durable in, in this case or for truck duty, I would say, or is that, it just depends. Yeah. Most, most of our engines have moved over to, um, to the dry uh, cam drive uh, chain being uh, being the, the more durable of uh, the two versions, yeah. I gotcha. Uh, what about like the, the blocks themselves and, and the heads? Um, 
you know, how those, uh, I guess, built and created for, for the Strux application? Mm. I am not an expert in, in those aspects of the different manufacturing processes that they go through. Um, I can tell you that there's nothing uh, unique in a sense between the, the designs for the car and the truck. So there's still, I mean, they're still pretty durable, in, including the crankshaft, right? All, all that, all those components. Right. Yeah, we've, you know, we've got a litany of, of harsh durability tests that we subject these engines to, and uh, they all come out, right? They, they don't, they don't go to production unless we can get to, get to a clean bill of health. So they're, uh, they're fun to test in a sense that you get to you get to develop them over time and, and get them figured out and get the engines to to live under these extreme conditions. So all of our tests are, are accelerated, harsh durability tests. You know, so we're doing we do things to the engines that uh, are accelerating the effects of of years and years of usage, and by doing that, the uh, the uh, engines are are need to perform under conditions that that you'll never even see in the field. Yeah, for for example, I mean, you, uh, can you mention some of those? Like, I mean, some of the towing tests, obviously J twenty eight oh seven compliant, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, specifically on our durability tests, you know, we'll, we'll have to operate at extreme conditions like peak power for extended amount of time, um, making sure that our engines are, are durable there. Um, from a ceiling standpoint, we'll, we'll heat cycle the engines rapidly, um, making them go from very cold temperatures to very uh, extreme warm engine conditions, showing uh, the worst cases that we could encounter in the field. And you kind of show that with the original torture series, right? Right. I, I can't remember. Did you did you do like a freezing test or something as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a there's a test we do where we soak the engine down um, to minus 20 C, and you know the whole engine gets encompassed in ice from the uh, condensation that builds up and then freezes on the engine block, and then. Uh, we light the wick and take it all the way up to um, you know full power, and uh, that's really harsh on head gaskets and uh, ceiling areas of the engine, and that's a way that we we get a good validation on uh, on those ceiling beads and also you know fatigue in general. Well, very cool. So we had um, in, we we usually cycle through some trucks in our fleet, so we buy uh, certain uh, vehicles. And then we kind of rotate them. We recently uh, had a 2019 Ford Ranger in our in our kind of a we call it a kind of a long term fleet. And uh, I was always pleased with the two three. So it actually um, it was in some, many ways surprising to me at least because it's just um, um, you know 270 horsepower may not sound like a huge number. But I think the torque number through 310 pound, 310 pound feet of torque uh, mm -hmm. just kind of gets up and goes in real in real terms. Um, so I'm kind of excited that you know that engine still continues. But also the 2.7, um, at least at least in the F-150 and the Bronco, um, has been quite impressive. So so I, I cannot wait to see how it how it matches to the Ranger. Yeah, no, I I love the two seven as well. I have I have one in in, in an F one fifty that I drive, and uh, it's a rocket ship. I can only imagine what it will be like in the Ranger. I haven't had the pri privilege to drive one yet, but it should be uh, a great powertrain. Well, very cool. Well, uh, Mike, thanks for spending the time here. Um, hopefully, this gives a, another perspective at uh, what's happening with the latest uh, pickup truck engines. Um, and also, um, I think the, the final point is that, um, you know, it's also, these engines are also there for efficiency, right? So even though, you know, V6s and uh, of course, V8 engines and full-size trucks 
are you know maybe kind of almost on their way out but there's i mean they're still there in some instances but uh, i think the turbocharged engines i'm hoping will continue to provide power we know they do that uh, but hopefully they also provide uh, a great deal of efficiency because uh, we all want that right yep. appreciate yeah, it's it it's interesting uh, to see. yep yeah it's great to great to to um have a time to speak to this and and uh, thanks for having me i appreciate it mike uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll see you soon sounds good thanks all right there's that a was well done there's a thank you there's a common theme here mm -hmm. that i'm already trying to <laughs> starting to see uh -huh. which is truck specific testing Right, you can put one of these engines in an SUV. You can put it in a sedan, or even a Mustang. Yeah, you can exactly the two point three high performance turbo is in a Mustang as right, well. Right, right. But truck people, us, and uh, we have we want to tow trailers. Right, we want to go off road on steep grades, mm -hmm. and the engine has to survive that. That's exactly it. Higher RPM higher temperatures that you're going to have to deal with, higher stress loads, things that normal everyday cars really don't have to worry about so much. Uh, so this is an interesting way of evaluating and looking at this and saying, mm, this is truck specific, not car specific. And there really is a difference. Yeah, and they have certain testing procedures specifically for that. Exacto mundo. Now, before we move on to the final interview, we have to mention that probably one of the biggest stories this year, despite the fact that GM and Ford have come out with these all-new powertrains, is Toyota's powertrains. Why is that? Well, because, well, not only because they're getting rid of their V6 mm -hmm. in the Tacoma, but the Tacoma is the class-leading bestseller in the midsize space. By a huge margin. Yes. They're, well, there are certain months where they almost outsell their entire competitive set. Combined. <laughs> Combined. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's getting a little bit more balanced these days, but mm -hmm. uh, huge numbers. And when Toyota makes a move especially in the class leading segment like this with the Tacoma. Right. You must take notice. But there's more to it than that too because Toyota's done one other thing aside from turbocharging going to four cylinders, they're also adding hybrid powertrains which none of the other little guys are currently doing. By by little guys I mean mid-sized trucks. Currently none of them offer a hybrid powertrain other than Toyota. So that in itself is interesting. And then add to that the fact that they've gone to this new uh, turbocharged powertrain. Yeah, it's a 2.4 liter, which actually exists in other SUVs right. currently. The Highlander now has it, and some Lexus SUVs now have that as well. Right. Um, so that's why I wanted to speak to Brian. Okay, and now I'm joined by Brian from the Toyota engineering team. So Brian, can you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. Nice to meet you, Andre. So I'm Brian Schneiderwin. I'm the vice Vice President of Powertrain Design here at Toyota uh, R&D in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, so okay. yeah, I've been. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Keep going. Yeah, I've been. I've been. Uh, with, been with Toyota about twenty-five years. Um, always in the design and evaluation. Uh, most of it. Most of it. About eighteen years in powertrain. Cool. And where uh, I see you are in a building, uh, talking to me uh, uh, over this. Uh, teleconference, but behind you looks to be a truck. Where, where are you located right now? Yeah, yeah, we were gonna talk about engine durability. So I brought you to the source. So this is uh, our our uh, high bay area of our Powertrain 2 building here in Ann Arbor. Uh, so this is where we prep our vehicles to either go on a chassis dyno or put our engines into engine durability tests, uh, which, which are behind the wall behind me. So um, yeah, I think, uh, tried to bring you to the source of, of why we can say that this engine uh, durability is okay. Yeah. So here's one of the, um, I, I, wanna, I don't want to say the dominant comment, but I, I've heard this several times when the Tacoma, the new one, the 2024 Toyota Tacoma was unveiled um, and it has a choice of several kind of power options, right? Uh, but at the core of it is a turbocharged four cylinder yeah. which is the 2.4 liter uh, four-cylinder turbo engine. Um, and some of the commenters said, well, bring my V6 back. It's a pickup truck. I want my V6. And, and I was trying to explain to them that um, turbocharging, you know, gives you more torque, more power. 
um, and in many respects, efficiency. So I wanted to take uh, get your take on this um, yeah. and bring in reliability into this uh, into this conversation as well. Great, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a it's a fair question. You know, you think more moving parts that means more risk, right? But um, downsized turbos are a technology we need to do in order to meet emissions and fuel economy. Uh, you mentioned uh, performance increases as well. But all of that's developed on the backdrop of the same durability expectations. Um, so for Toyota, that means 30 years of Tacoma truck usage. And all of that customer feedback has been built into our durability standards. And so I can say we're kind of a world-class expectation in terms of engine durability. And at no point during this 2.4 liter turbo engine did we compromise those those durability standards. So uh, yes, it's got a turbo. It's different than the the outgoing V6, but um, you know we we were able to develop the engine with improved performance, improved efficiency, um, while keeping all the same uh, durability and also serviceability requirements that you you really come to trust with Toyota. That's that's cool, and obviously you're in your test facility, which is yeah really, really cool for me to kind of get a little taste of, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of discuss some of the items, right? So um, it's a four cylinder and then also bring in the hybrid as well. Okay. But can you talk about a little bit of the, you know, how's the engine designed? I, I heard a lot of questions. Does this new four cylinder have a belt driven valve train or chain or, you know, different questions like that? Okay. Yeah, I think the, the um, to answer that directly, it's a, it's a chain. Um, and I think maybe more importantly is um, how we test it, how we make sure that the, that the performance is, is the same. And so in this case, our testing breaks into three different areas. The first is durability, uh, second is function, and then the last is real world testing. So first is durability. Um, in this case, this turbo was adopted from a kind of a transverse SUV application into our truck, but it's got 1.6 times the durability lifetime of or, or testing lifetime of that SUV application. So we're already knowing that the truck customer usage and expectation for how long they're going to keep the vehicle is higher. And so our test standards are higher for that. Another durability test we do is thermal. Um, and that's where we, we exercise the engine uh, kind of like you wouldn't believe. And and those test standards are are 1.3 times uh, the standard of, of the SUV application. And I don't know if you've ever been in a an engine dyno during a thermal test, uh, but it's it's uh, it's a job perk. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, this so, thing will go ahead. No, so I, I've been um, I've seen some V8 engines uh, run mm -hmm. at Redline for an extended period of time. Uh, and it's super loud, you know, they're on an engine dyno and in this room. Um, but I haven't seen, you know, hot and cold because you also freeze, freeze your engines, right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's a tough test for us is, um, we'll take it up to, for us, we don't redline it. I think actually the, the heat and load are higher right around 5,000 RPM, but that turbo changes from black to red to white. It's so hot. And then we quickly cool it, um, and that thermal stress on the on the turbo, on the cylinder head, on the block, is really trying to exercise that engine and make sure that in any, any application you're not going to have issues with gaskets, you're not going to have issues with cracks, you're not going to have issues with any of the bolts loosening. Um, so those tests are hard; they're fun to watch, um, very hard to to pass. Um, I think as an engineer, that's what you love and hate about Toyota is it's really hard to pass our test. And there's, there's no, um, there's no wiggle room if you're not meeting the specification. So, um, we do do those, those thermal events you mentioned where you, you run it hot and then cool it quickly and then just repeat and repeat and repeat and, um, and see how tough the engine is. So, and of course, I mean, you have to pick the right materials you know, for the engine, right? The engine, the block, the gaskets, all all of the above, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the engine itself, comparing to the SUV, almost 50% of the parts were designed newly. Um, 
So because of those test standards being tougher, it, it kind of drives you to have to uh, make them uh, last different or longer and and um, and harder in those in those new environments. So the I would say that overall the the materials aren't that significantly different than the SUV, but I think the the shape and orientation and features of those parts are are what uh, allow us to to meet that. Uh, that higher durability expectation for a truck customer. I got gotcha. you. And then, are you also involved, you know, with transmission, the entire powertrain? Uh, yeah. Testing. Yeah, and so um, obviously, it's not just about in the engine. You know, I think the the eight speed transmission that we uh, build in Texas that goes into the Tacoma um, also. Uh, that's actually most of my background. I spent about eighteen years in transmission design. Um, and it there's tough tough tests of whether it's high speed gear running uh several function testing um that uh we we exercise these uh transmissions as much as the engine to make sure that um the clutches last um the torque converter lockup system works the same the solenoids last all uh the the full lifetime of the vehicle so um there's there's a lot of tests so I, let me get back to kind of the types of tests we do. So I mentioned durability mostly, but also for the truck customer, the um, function test is just as important because we know truck customers don't drive on flat roads. So in particular for this powertrain, we've got a dynamometer that tilts. And so we'll have really extreme, you almost couldn't drive at those angles of nose down, nose up, uh, tilt right, tilt left. And during those tests, we'll have clear oil pans and clear uh, covers so that we can see how the oil flow is happening during those extreme tilts uh, to make sure that no air gets pulled into the system, um, as well as making sure that the PCV separators don't allow oil um, into the blow-by gas and, and uh, prevent carbon buildup in the, in the cylinders. Yeah, I got you, because it, I mean, it really has to be rooted in the function of the vehicle, right? Yeah. Because the pickup truck is rated to tow higher, <clears throat> higher weights. Um, the payloads are higher. Uh, you know, when you compare it, for example, to a Highlander, right? The function of a Toyota Highlander to the Comar definitely different. Yeah, different. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. So, can you um, let's bring in the hybrid powertrain now? Great. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you have uh, a couple of different power levels on your turbocharged powertrain, uh, but now you're adding a um, electric component to this. Yes. Yeah. So that's it's really uh, a great solution for the customers because it gives you both performance and fuel economy. Often you kind of get a trade off with those, uh, but by electrifying the powertrain and putting that motor in, it's it's actually a, a, the same motor as the Tundra. So it's a 48 horsepower one motor that is sandwiched in between the engine and the transmission. And what that really opens us up to do is, is allow that low end torque that motors are, are great for, um, as well as allowing certain modes to so drive an EV or get the electric boost. And then when you brake, you're regenerating that energy. So you end up with the uh, better performance um, while also getting a better fuel economy, which, uh, I, it's it's rare that you get both, but um, we think that electrification really enables that, and and we've kind of brought our Toyota hybrid uh, heritage into trucks with Tundra first, and now um, into Tacoma as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, obviously, I I kind of took a close look at the Tundra system, and also the Sequoia. I believe is using the same system yeah. mm -hmm. uh, as far as the electric component of it. And then uh, the battery is nickel metal hydra, correct? Yes. All right. So, so tell me, uh, is that from the kind of your the history of your hybrid systems, or why did you select that battery versus some others? Yeah, yeah. I think certainly battery chemistries are changing quickly. Um, this particular battery cell is a is what we consider a power cell. So. The energy density is enough, but the power density is really good. And so that allows a lot of energy to flow back and forth between regen and launch um, 
And so those those cells are are discharging and charging quite frequently. And so that power density is is really what we're after in that particular cell. And so um, for us, nickel metal hydrate was a, a solid uh, cell choice for that for this powertrain. And I think you know it 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 additionally has a a, a lot more history behind it um, uh, of you know having durability. I think I. I think I, I myself have a, a Prius with 110,000 miles and my battery still works perfect. I still get 50 miles per gallon and that's a nickel metal hydride battery. So I think uh, that's a that's a little bit of assurance as well going into having a, um, putting that into a truck product of, of just having those those 20 plus years of, um, of know-how with nickel metal hydride. I got you. Um, we, we also had a question about uh, I guess serviceability, or yeah. um, can you uh, talk to that a little bit? Because sure, there's, there's perception that oh, a V6 engine I can work on, but you know this new system I cannot. Yeah, so maybe a similar answer to the durability specifications that uh, each of us as design engineers, when we release a drawing and and kind of finish the design, there's always a check sheet to make sure it meets our serviceability requirements. And so things like timing chain adjustment or spark plug replacement, um, hand space and tool space are all considered in the in the engine bay. So um, you know, I think Toyota is pretty well known for that of, of using common fastener sizes and common designs so that um, someone with, with a healthy knowledge of maintenance can approach this engine, approach this powertrain and be able to service it um, without any um, risks of kind of uh, new technology or, or divergent technology that would uh, kind of get them frustrated that they they wouldn't be able to maintain or service themselves. I got you. Yeah, I mean, that's very important. I, and I think as soon as people, you know, see, get to know this new truck, you know, and see it in person, maybe maybe, you know, some of those questions will be quickly answered as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know, change is hard. I think I think it's always asking a lot of a customer when you change the technology, whether it's introducing the one motor hybrid, or whether it's introducing a turbocharged engine. But I guess I just want to reinforce our durability standards are the same, our service and reliability expectations are the same, and and you know, I think we we haven't disappointed customers in the past in those areas, and and we continue that heritage with with this powertrain. I got you. And um, do you also run the electric components on the dyno? How does that work? I mean, I can picture the four-cylinder on the dyno, but yeah. how, how does the electric components test it? Yeah, so um, typically in, in two ways. I think the first and the, the majority of the tests are at a component level uh, where you're running that motor at different speeds. And you know, motors are motors are tricky in themselves in terms of insulating the motor windings from um, from any shorts. In terms of getting the the gap between the rotor and the stator correct, and uh, making sure there's uh, no degradation over the lifetime, uh, making sure the permanent magnets uh, uh, that are bonded into the to the rotor core don't move around and change. So, all of the similar. Uh, abuse testing that you would expect on an engine is also done on that motor. And so, um, you know, it, again, kind of building on our history, we've had uh, hybrids in the market with electric motors since 1997. And we've seen a lot of things with, you know, uh, hurricane floods, um, extreme cold temperatures, extreme hot temperatures. We've seen how our motors behave and we've learned a lot from those experiences. And so when we set our durability standards for those motors, um, it's it's right up there at, at top level and, and we need to be able to pass all those same tests. So at the component level, we're doing those motor evaluations. Um, and then of course, at a system level, we need to make sure that those motors together with the inverter system, together with the batteries, together with the engine, all are seamless where the customer you know, they press the accelerator, they don't necessarily know how much the motor is boosting versus the engine. They just feel a good drive force that that uh, feels natural and comfortable for them. I see. Um, I, and obviously, we 
the Tacoma is not in production yet, so we haven't, you know, driven it, or at least I haven't. Uh, but was the philosophy of the uh, philosophy of the hybrid Tacoma performance uh, similar to the Tundra, where it's kind of both performance, so it's a cumulative combination of the gasoline and electric power, but also efficiency. Was it was philosophy similar to the bigger truck? So yes, I think. Um, in fact, I think night this this particular Tacoma took it a step further uh we called it trinity activity where at an early stage sometimes you know there's a trade-off between power performance um fuel economy and drivability and um and at an early stage we really tried to set targets objective targets for each of those and so um there wasn't a we were able to balance all three of those and without having to compromise um any one of those at the end i think maybe historically drivability because it's such a subjective thing. We'll, we'll prioritize power performance, we'll prioritize fuel economy, and then you get towards the end of the, the development cycle and suddenly you're painted in a corner for drivability. But upfront by making all of those targets objective, we could balance those well. And um, I think it was a really good demonstration of collaborating across the calibration team, the hardware team um, in order to, to make sure that the, the, the drivability performance and fuel economy were all um, a, a fair balance and a good balance that a customer would appreciate. Very cool. Well, I, obviously I can't wait to drive one and we will later this year. So um, I really appreciate your time. Did we hit most of the points, um, do you think? I do. I um, Let me think. Um, we talked about durability. We talked about time and chain. Uh, talked about the turbocharger design. Um, I think. Oh, maybe, maybe, uh, um, maybe an additional point that um, we designed it to this that I mentioned about fifty percent of the parts are new. Um, so we were actually actually able to increase the performance from the front wheel drive two point five four liter turbo. Um, while at the same time changing from a premium fuel to a regular fuel. And I think that for our truck customer, I think that was that was more in line with the expectation of, of their usage. Um, so we were kind of able to do all of those uh, performance improvements, but but still do it with a with a regular fuel. I think that was a pretty big achievement for for the design of this engine. Yeah, and you're talking about 87 octane, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the requirement. Yeah, because usually people associate turbocharging with higher octanes, right? But it's, yeah, and often pickup trucks are usually, especially work trucks, right? Yeah. Uh, the value has to be in mind all the way yeah. across the board. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe that's just an indication or a good uh, symbolic point about that we developed this engine with the truck customer in mind. It, it wasn't just, uh, we didn't take an engine that was sitting on a shelf and sort of shoehorn it into a truck. I think it was designed and developed with the intention and kind of high expectations of meeting a Tacoma durability um, and knowing how hard our customers drive Tacoma that really needed to live up to those, um, those reliability expectations. All right, Brian. Well, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Good to meet you. Hopefully, we'll meet in person and I actually so. uh, drive the truck together. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Andres. Yeah, it's great to talk to you today. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. I think that that is, at least for now, as much inside baseball as we can all handle. <laughs> Thank you, Andre, for putting all the together. Guys, this took a lot of work over a long period of time. I, I kind of joke and say it's a month. It was actually a lot more than that if you think about how long it took you to gather everything. So thank you for doing that. And this isn't the only time we're going to be doing this. Now that you've done this, people are going to expect you to do it again. Oh, boy. What, yeah. what have I started? Exactly. Well, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, as new powertrains arrive and you guys have questions, uh, we will try to answer them in many ways. And by the way, yes, I wish these interviews were in person. Yes. And we actually hand our hands on the engines themselves and pointing. That will come a little later with the Tacoma uh, and to some extent with Ford as well. Right. Uh, but this is right now, as soon as we can get it to you, you got the answers. Let us know what you think. 
Yes, please. We're going to be reading these comments, so leave comments down below. Send us emails. Let us know what you think. Yeah, this is as much as we could get. Yes. Right. I, I wish they would have invited us into the dino rooms, right? Mm -hmm. But there's certain things they must keep still to their chest, right? Because this is highly competitive segment. Well, we are journalists, and so we do try to fish for information, and perhaps they don't want to give it all up, right? So thank you very much, Andre, for putting this together. And guys, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you had a good time. All right, and we'll see you next week, as always.